Hi, and welcome to this overview of feminist frameworks. So I'll first be talking about feminist theory specifically. Um, stop and think about what words you associate with feminism. Positive words, negative words, neutral words. And the point of this activity is to illustrate that although the term feminist is controversial in our overall society, it really isn't actually controversial in the field of family studies anymore. It was when it emerged in the early 80s, maybe even into the 90s, but now it's a, an established framework from which to view the family. So those of you who have learned about feminism elsewhere, you might recognize that some of these assumptions are, seem to be more like first and second wave feminism, and we'll talk about third wave, wave feminism in an upcoming slide. So the first assumption, gender structures all societies. You know, we like our categories, um, not just in gender, but in, in many aspects of life. And so even though we're allowing gender to be more fluid than in the past, you know, many people still have a tendency to want people to choose um, a gender, or you may feel pressure to choose a gender and then identify yourselves. And the way uh, gender structures, everything for, can be seen, for example, with current transgender and um, gender non-binary uh, experiences and, you know, struggles over which bathroom people are allowed to use or which pronouns to use. The next uh, two assumptions, women are subordinated and the family is an institution for kind of perpetuating that. So the assumptions of feminist theory are that in general, women have had less power historically and that families, while wonderful, often perpetuate this. So for example, in a heterosexual family in which the husband works full time and the wife works part time and stays home taking care of children, if that couple is to divorce, the man's income continues to rise um, with his worker status and the woman's income really declines because we don't, as we'll see, place a premium value on care work. Um, another assumption is about feminism is that it's emancipatory. This means that feminism emphasizes social change. Um, the other theories that we have studied just simply to describe, simply tried to describe families and feminism is different in that it tries to um, say equality is the ideal. We should we should have social change. And then the last one is, you know, the family is not monolithic. That just means that you know, there's varying forms of families and not all families are that SNAF or standard North American family that we've talked about. Okay, so there's obviously lots of intellectual traditions for feminist theory, which developed elsewhere before it came into the field of family studies. And I'll just highlight a few of them. So Mary Wollstonecraft, she was writing at the end of the 1700s, and she said, for example, that women failed to develop their minds because their only avenue of, of obtaining power was through marriage. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, um, she had this interesting proposal that the services that women provided, and she was writing right around 1900. Um, so the services women provided, a cook, nutritionist, childcare, cleaning, these should be paid professions offered at the community level rather than the family level. That woman, one woman would cook for her entire neighborhood. One woman would provide the childcare for her, for her block. One woman would clean for multiple families, basically as a way of elevating women's work and tying some money to it. Um, you may know Char Charlotte Perkins Gilman's name from <clears throat> a short story in, in an American literature class in high school called The Yellow Wallpaper. This was about a woman experiencing postpartum depression that her husband, who was a doctor, required that she bed be on bed rest in her room and wouldn't, you know, wouldn't let her leave. And eventually she went insane, kind of crawling around the edges of her room. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, interestingly, also wrote a book called Herland, which was um, about a female utopia where no men lived. So there's that kind of male bashing part of feminism, right? Okay, so um, the anthropologist Margaret Mead, she argued um, that gendered behaviors were cultural and not genetic, and she studied societies in which females were, for example, more aggressive and males were more nurturing. And then Betty Friedan, um, feminine mystique. So Friedan really challenged the notions that the American dream um, of the nuclear family in the suburbs was in the 1950s was the best thing. And so she coined that phrase, the problem with no name. 
and also Mother's Little Helper, uh, which referred to Valium in the 1950s that women took to try to kind of keep them happy. So obviously, you know, many women in the 1950s maybe were happy with their roles, but there were a lot of women who weren't. And as we'll see when we get into historical context and read uh, Stephanie Kuntz, rates of anxiety and depression were pretty high for women in the 1950s. As you may have learned elsewhere, feminist theory distinguishes between sex, which is your biology, and gender or gender roles, which is the meaning or the attitude or the behavior. And gender roles, according to feminist theory, is are created uh, via an interactional process between individuals and society, also referred to here as the institution. So think about the father role and how that's changed. You know, 20 years ago, I had friends who would push a stroller down a street and would stop and be complimented for what an amazing father they were. We don't see that quite so much anymore, at least not here in the United States. Um, because men are taking on more of the daily tasks of caring for kids. So we've had a lot of men at the individual level create change, which then changes what it means to be a dad at the societal or institutional level, which then reciprocally changes what men do at the individual level. Sexism occurs when sex is seen as basically genetically determined or immutable, unchangeable, and also kind of harmful or damaging attributions are made about all men or women. Even if these sound kind of positive, like all women are nurturing, that's still damaging, right? And obviously something like all men aggr are aggressive is as well. Um, power and privilege. So going back to those first, second, third waves of feminism, the first wave of feminism was really about getting women the right to vote. The second wave was more about women's rights. Both of these movements were really geared towards white women. It was considered kind of a white women's movement until the third wave of feminism. And the third wave of feminism emerged in the 1990s and really went beyond gender to look at all forms of oppression, uh, according to class, race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, physical ability, religion. Um, and so now feminists are really seeking to empower those with less power. And then uh, that leads to that concept of intersectionality, um, which we'll see more about coming as we go and in, move into contexts around race and ethnicity and LGBTQ, um, that we can, people can be marginalized in multiple ways, not just one. Um, and then lastly, concepts of family, household, and care work. Uh, feminist theory has always focused on those kind of like those assumptions that the family is a, a way that women have been subordinated. So the more we um, make women's work about care work and then we don't assign money to it, we devalue it, then we um, you know, kind of perpetuate uh, lack of power for women. And, and certainly still, um, you know, those of you who are HDFS majors, you know we don't pay that much for care work. It's often unpaid or lower paid. We tend to pay a lot more money for taking care of things than we do people. Feminist theory also tries to highlight and deconstruct the ideology of separate spheres, also kind of known as the concepts of public and private spheres. So prior to the Industrial Revolution, we didn't have so much of a sense that women should be responsible for the home and men should be responsible for work outside the home. But once we had the Industrial Revolution, some people had to go to work in factories and some people had to stay home. And so we really created an ideology that it should be men leaving the home and women staying at home. And that became kind of our gender socialization. Um, and we still, to some extent, operate on that, that men should be ideal workers and women should have primary responsibility for house and child care. Even if we don't necessarily believe that, we can often feel those expectations kind of come down on our shoulders if we become, you know, mothers or fathers. Um, and then this all led to, uh, the, you know, men as, as breadwinners um, and maybe even men as the sole economic provider. That really was ever attainable for mostly upper and middle class families, um, except during some of the kind of early and mid 1900s where we really had this sense that a man should be able to earn a family wage. And so then fatherhood really became kind of um, associated with breadwinning, whereas prior to the Industrial Revolution and the public-private spheres, fatherhood was more about morality or discipline and not so much about financially providing. So now we're going to talk about a couple of different versions of feminism, liberal feminism and cultural feminism. And you may, for example, identify as a feminist 
and read something that's written by a feminist that you disagree with because it's from the another camp of feminism. Um, so this kind of helps clarify that you might agree with some aspects of feminism, but not others. Okay, so liberal feminism and gender theory, um, these would technically be slightly different, but they're very similar. Uh, like gender theory grew out of liberal feminism, and so I'm going to lump them together. So um, liberal feminism and gender theory uh, basically minimize the innate or biological differences between sexes. They see males and females as inherently more similar, and gender difference is really socially constructed. Um, and, and just as an aside, if you're doing your theory paper on feminist theory, you might try searching for gender theory sometimes, or if you see gender theory, that tells you that you're using a, uh, you know, liberal feminism. Okay, so that idea of um, uh, doing gender, right? It was a this was a famous phrase coined by Weston Zimmerman in the 1980s that we often kind of, based on kind of what society tells us, that institutional gender, we do it at the individual level. Um, and so, for example, I remember one morning I was on a weekend, I was making my kids breakfast. I was making them pancakes and bacon and a fruit shake. And I was so impressed that I with myself for having made them three things. And so when they sat down at the counter to eat, I pronounced, I made you three things, pancakes, bacon, and a fruit shake. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm an amazing mother. And they in chorus said, you're as good as daddy, right? So that was funny here. I thought I was doing gender, but my husband was actually doing the mother role in some ways better. Um, okay, so meaning versus behavior. Oh, gender as dynamic. That just means that um, it's changing, right? So our gendered roles or our views about males, females, mothers, fathers, boys, girls, whatever, um, binary gender, like all that can be shifting and changing over time. It's not necessarily static. So originally the conceptualization around sex roles was this idea that we would in childhood develop a sense of masculinity or femininity or a combination of both and we would carry that through our lives. But in reality, people's uh, gender identity and roles really shift. Okay, so meaning and behavior. In a time of social transition, basically some aspects of um, a couple, for example, gender roles may change at a different pace um, in than others. So they could have an incongruence between their attitude and, the be and their behavior, either at the individual level or at the couple level. So for example, maybe I'm a man who believes that I should be the breadwinner, but the my wife is earning more than me. Um, and having that inconsistency between kind of what's my actual behavior and my attitude can, can be associated with less individual or, for example, relationship well-being. However, oftentimes our attitudes can change once our situation has changed. The situation, research says, is pretty powerful. So a laid-off father who takes care of his children more than he expected might come to change the meaning that he makes around his father role. A woman, woman earning a high salary might change her own constructions of being a breadwinner. So that further kind of illustrates that idea of gender as dynamic. In, so here's an example of how meaning and behavior um, can be different and how feminism might attend to both of these concepts. So in heterosexual couples, wives on average spend more time than husbands on, in, on household labor and childcare. That gap is narrowing. Um, women, men are doing slightly more and women are doing a lot less. They're either hiring it out or letting it go. Um, but what matters more than the actual hours for uh, relationship satisfaction is wives' perceptions of fairness. Um, so it doesn't actually matter, you know, how equal it is in terms of time. It matters how she believes it, it is fair in term, in kind of that's a bigger predictor of relationship satisfaction. So her perception may, may be based on what she witnessed growing up. Um, or maybe she's comparing herself to her friends. She is comparing herself and her husband to her friends and their husbands. Or maybe she's been married before and her current husband is doing a lot more. And so she perceives it's fair. Oh, okay, so cultural feminism is similar to liberal feminism in that it also wants, you know, equality for males and females and empowerment of women. But cultural feminism goes at this a slightly different way. It, it is more likely to highlight differences between men and women um, and 
sees those as what are called essential or innate um, differences. So this idea that maybe there's some essential f female traits as being more peaceful or more nurturing or more emotionally expressive. And so cultural feminism would say, it's not our differences that are the problem, but instead it's how we value um, differences. And so, for example, nurturing and caring should be valued as much as being strong and brave, or emotion should be valued as much as intellect. Um, and so we need to give equal value to both kind of innate or inherent female and male qualities. And cultural feminism would also be more likely to advocate for special treatment for women based on like having less strength or more responsibility for, or, you know, sole responsibility for childbearing. Um, some, you know, older examples of this, if, if you run across ever um, in terms of discussions of morality, Carol, Carol Gilligan in a different voice, she was theorizing that women um, uh, had an ethic of care and men had an ethic of justice. That would be an example of cultural feminism, a, a difference in how um, men and women kind of made moral decisions. Rachel Hare Mustin is on the picture is in the picture on the left with a former professor of mine. She's a psychologist, retired now, academic, um, and she developed this very famous concept of alpha bias and beta bias, which has been used to describe gender, and it's also been used with sexual orientation and race and ethnicity. And she made up these terms, alpha and beta bias, from the errors that we can make in hypothesis testing, alpha error and beta error, which you may have learned about in a statistics class. And so alpha error is the probability that you will say there's a difference between these two populations that doesn't actually exist. And beta error is the likelihood that you'll show no difference between these populations when in fact one actually does exist. So applied to gender, alpha bias is exaggerating differences between males and females that don't exist. And beta bias is making them sound more similar that they, than they are maybe in terms of power and privilege and ignoring differences. And so our goal is to try to stay in the middle and avoid either extreme. In class, we stand and put ourselves on this continuum and talk about why we are where we are in terms of emphasizing difference between men and women, males and females, or emphasizing similarities, um, and whether or not we see differences as biological, socially constructed, or some of both. And I also make the point that we will throughout our lives move around on this continuum as I have myself, sometimes emphasizing more difference, sometimes emphasizing more similarity. The next few slides are going to illustrate how we tend to exaggerate difference in our society, particularly in the media, and even researchers tend to look for gender difference. So my son was really into uh, gross motor skills and balls as a kid. And so sometimes people would say something like, oh, he's all boy or he's such a boy. Yet at the same time, they kind of seemed to miss that his favorite color was magenta, and that he was pretty emotional. Um, and so we tend to look for the ways that people um, meet our conceptualization of gender differences and miss the ways that maybe males and females are more similar. So queer theory is very similar to um, gender theory and, and kind of a combination of feminist frameworks and also symbolic interaction theory, which focuses a lot on meaning and role and identity, which we don't study in this class, but still a useful framework in the field of family studies. So queer theory, as we'll see, definitely challenges the binaries or the categories, and it also sees sexual orientation and gender identity as a social construction, you know, that's influenced by both individ an individual's experience, but also by institutional factors, um, that it's focused on kind of the meaning and that people might be making different meaning about, um, you know, different identities around sexual orientation and gender, that it's, it can vary across people and it can also be dynamic, meaning that, um, you know, how I am identifying in terms of my sexual orientation today might not be how I did in the past or how I will in the future, how I think about my gendered role might, might shift over time. Minyan Moore wrote a book um, not too long ago called Invisible Families um, based on her qualitative research with black lesbians and how they constructed identity. And I think this is a nice example of kind of the queer theory 
um, ideas around identity construction, you know, being socially constructed, being individual and institutional, being varying, dynamic, and, you know, kind of focused on meaning. And so more um, asked black uh, lesbians which identity was more important to them, being a black person, a lesbian, or a woman, and then also ask them who did they have the most in common with, a black straight man, a white lesbian, or a black man, to kind of get at those identity constructions. And um, interestingly, you know, black lesbians identity construction was all focused on kind of, you know, it understandably focused around race and gender and sexuality. And that was, you know, part of her questions. But what she found was that race was the most common primary identity. And this quote from a research participant kind of exemplifies that. People see your blackness and the world has affected me by my blackness since the very inception of time. Sexuality is something secondary to the color of your skin, at least for African Americans in this country. And so that kind of gets at this tension between the individual and institutional influences on identity development. Um, she also kind of got at uh, some of the intersectionality of social class and other contexts um, by finding, for example, that high um, education and income black lesbians were slower to accept their lesbian identity and least likely to be out in the workplace, whether that was because they were concerned about uh, being out that it might jeopardize their education or their career, or because they had been so focused on education or career, they hadn't been able to focus so much on identity development. So queer theory makes heteronormativity explicit and then challenges it. So heteronormativity is basically the ideology that heterosexuality is normative and it's the way to be. And it's comprised of, you know, a few different sub ideologies. So there's a gender ideology that you have to be um, male or female and take on the corresponding gendered role. And we penalize, you know, boys and girls and men and women for not acting appropriately. There's the sexual ideology, which is that heterosexual intercourse is the gold standard and all else is somehow ne less natural or valid. Um, and then there's the family, family ideology or binary that doing family, uh, real family means it's legal, it's biological, it's heterosexual, and all else is less than ideal or not as genuine. So someone, uh, you know, a child might not be considered your kid if your biology didn't contribute or your partner might not get invited to family events such as weddings. Um, and it's also comprised of this idea that we just, uh, yeah, assume um, heterosexuality. And so um, if you have a chance to watch the little uh, clip from Love, Simon, why is this, why is straight the default? It kind of illustrates, it illustrates heteronormativity. When someone has a minority status in some way, we oftentimes make that the most important thing about them. So my friend who's gay or my friend who's black, you can see the examples up there as well. And this is called giving them a master identity or master status based on whatever it is that makes them a little bit different. In this case, sexual orientation. And the challenge is that it implies that their sexual orientation is the most important thing to their identity. And it ignores all the other things that are important to our identity. What really matters, though, is where that gay or lesbian individual is at. Is it is it really important that this is a part of their identity right now? Is it is that one of the first things that they would tell you about themselves? Or is it not so important for them right now that they're focused on other aspects of their identities? So it's mainly that we don't want to put other people in boxes. And I'll tell you a quick example of how I fell into this trap. I had a professor who was openly a lesbian, and I found out she researched sexual minority youth. And I thought that was appropriate since she was a lesbian. And in some months later, I found out she also researched people who had Alzheimer's. And I thought, well, that's weird. What does that have to do with being gay? Because I assumed that that was the most important thing about her and she wouldn't research anything else or have any other interests. So it's definitely a theme in this literature to move beyond the binary constructions of sexuality and gender. And recently, students have helped me even redo these continua to help account for people who might be identify as agender or asexual. And we can imagine that we are all sh 
have the potential to shift around on these throughout our lives, some people more than others, and that we might be low on something else and high on something different, and that these might not always seem congruent. Um, so for example, in the reading by more that we are doing for this piece, Zoe is female, but her gender identity is a little bit both male and female because she says, in my heart lies a black man. And her she identifies more with a masculine gender role and is gay. Um, Beverly is female in the more reading, but her gender identity is more female. She has a more masculine gender role orientation um, because she's a doctor and a sole breadwinner and that's how she's constructed things. So related <clears throat> to theory is minority stress theory. Um, LGBTQ individuals are more likely to report anxiety, depression, suicidality, substance use disorders. Um, and minority stress theory would say it's not something inherently within people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer that's making them at risk. It's the chronic stress associated with being a sexual minority that leads to increased uh, risk of mental health issues. Um, this theory would distinguish between proximal stressors, meaning uh, close, and then distal stressors, meaning far. So proximal stressors might include the stress of <clears throat> being out or not out and concealing your sexual orientation or gender identity. It could be internalized heterosexism or homophobia or fear of rejection. And then distal might be experiencing discrimination or hate crimes. Um, something that's external. And as you might imagine, if you ho hold more than one minority status, this can exacerbate, uh, be exacerbated.